You better give them lots of hints on how to do the second yeah, one. Yeah, I did. Okay, if there's any uh, question about the second homework, ask uh, I for hints. Okay. So let's get started. Are there any questions uh, before we get started? If not, I'd like to go to chapter 5 of the lecture notes. So we talk about some mathematical concepts in chapter 5. So that you have these concepts uh, that are necessary for understanding quantum mechanics. Because I believe that um, without this mathematical understanding, you would have a difficult time understanding quantum mechanics. This is for you, right? You put yeah, this down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, I won't erase this yet. Okay. So today is uh, February 4th. So let's talk about some of the concepts. I, I'm sure that a lot of you know these concepts already, but if that is the case, this will be just a revision for you. But otherwise, uh, this might be an interesting thing for you to learn. So, the thing is that uh, we'll talk about vector, vector space, and then we'll talk about functions and spectrum. Okay, these are concepts that you might not have learned in electrical engineering, thinking of the vector. Uh, in electrical engineering, you do have something that might be related to a vector, for instance, you have a function of time. And that function of time might look something like this, and so on. And this is called an analog signal. But in electrical engineering, we never store an analog signal the way it is, but then we store it as a digital signal, so we might store it digitized at certain locations. So we always store something like this. This might be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then J or something like F or I or something. So f of i is used to represent the function f of t. And if you think of f of t, it is function. But you can think of f of i as a vector. Because when you store f of i, you can store uh, f of i as a column vector where the i element is f of i. Okay. So you can actually stack all this value into a vector, making this look like a vector. And it is used a lot in quantum mechanics, where a function is thought of as a vector. Okay, a function is thought of as a vector. So a function of x, for instance, is a vector, because it is a limiting case of f of x of i, which is f of i, where if you were to Replied this as a function of x. When delta x goes to zero, f of x becomes or f of i becomes f of x. Okay. So let's look at some of the vector concepts that we have learned in linear algebra. We learn inner product in linear algebra that if we have an inner product between two vectors, you can often write it in this manner. Okay, this is called an inner product. But then, how do I write such an inner product for a function which should now be regarded as the vector? So, if I have two functions, f and g, the inner product notation is usually written in this manner. Okay, this is to mean that when you take this inner product, if these are functions of one dimension, they should be f of x, g of x, where conjugation is taken somewhere. This might be an integration from minus infinity to infinity, or it might be something from minus a to plus a or something. And if you think about this, this is just a limiting case of this if you were to 
say approximate this integral with a discrete summation, then you have something like this g of j delta x, which is essentially just very similar to uh, something like f j g j conjugate. So very similar to this kind of inner product. So this is called a direct notation. The direct love to use it or in the product, okay? Where this is called a bra and this is called a cat. Okay, this is also called a bracket notation. You can see the bracket, okay, bracket notation. And he loved to use this to represent inner product, but in mathematics literature, inner product is also written like this. And sometimes written like this. And all of them meant the same thing. Okay, all of them meant the same thing. Okay. But in electromagnetics, sometimes we say this explicitly that in electromagnetics, sometimes this just means Fx, G of X. This is usually called a reaction inner product. And this is usually called the energy inner product. Because if F is equal to G, this is actually the magnitude square. And this looks like an energy. But this is something called reaction in electromagnetics that you might learn, you might learn later on in your courses uh, in electrical engineering. Okay. So this kind of inner product is analogous to something like F conjugate, not conjugate transpose, F times G, okay? Whereas this kind of inner product is analogous to F conjugate transpose dot G. Okay, so the reaction inner product is a simple inner product where you do not take conjugate transpose of the transpose vector. Whereas an energy inner product is an inner product where you take <laughs> the transpose plus its conjugation, where F dagger is the same as F transpose and then followed by conjugation and then for F dagger. So this kind of thing is going to be used repeatedly. The good thing about the energy in the product is that uh, if you make the two functions the same, okay, then what you have then is that um, this will be equal to the X, F of X, F of x, and then this will be the x, f of x squared. Okay? And this is always positive definite. This is always <coughs> positive definite. Okay, if f x is not equal to zero, this is always positive definite. So because this is always positive definite and real, okay, real and positive definite. If fx is not equal to zero, if this is not equal to zero everywhere, then this is always positive definite and larger than zero. So this can be used as a measure of length. So you can define a norm of a function to be the square root of this thing, which is very similar to how we define the length of a vector in linear algebra. If you have linear algebra, then in order to define the norm of the vector v, we take that to be v conjugate transpose v, and then we take the square root of v. Okay, very similar to that concept. And because of that, uh, this is called a norm, and then you can use this to form a distance between two functions. So if you have two functions, you can now think of them as vectors, and the distance between them can be just to be the norm of the distance of the vector. 
So if you have a set of functions that are complete and orthonormal, if a set of functions n is to the 1 to infinity, this set of function is complete and orthonormal. Orthonormal means that they are orthogonal to each other when you take a complex conjugation here. And that they integrate to 1 when n equals m, but they integrate to 0 when n is not equal to m. We have found many functions like this before. Okay, complete and orthonormal. Complete means that they can be used to expand all kinds of functions. Say, if this is a function defined between, say, 0 and a, then given any function that we have, that is defined in this interval, okay, x is between 0 and a, okay? Given any functions that is defined in this interval, then we can expand this function, arbitrary function, in terms of this orthonormal set. And we can go from, say, 1 to infinity, for instance. And this is the meaning of completeness. Functions that are complete are like, Fourier series expansion n pi x over a or e to the i n pi x over 2a kind of thing and, and so on and these functions have been proven to be complete and it can be used to expand any function in a given interval. Okay, they might be also cosine of n pi x over a kind of thing. These are examples of complete functions and you might have the gender polynomial, this is called the gender polynomial, Chabrishan polynomial. And so on. So there are many examples of complete functions. And if they are complete, then you can find this coefficient very easily, but we can also use direct notation to think of this has been an expansion such as this. And let me express direct notation slightly more. This f, which is the bra, can be thought as a transpose of a vector. And then this other function g is just a vector. So when we write an inner product like this, it's like finding the conjugate transpose, I could say the conjugate transpose. The conjugate transpose. So this is like the conjugate transpose of the vector f. So if you start with an initial vector f, okay, if you convert into a bra vector, it can be thought of as a conjugate transpose of this vector. So for instance, U is conjugate transpose is U jackal. F is conjugate transpose will be <coughs> F bar like this of the bra of the F vector. Okay? So when we write um, something like this, we are actually thinking of this as an abstract vector. Okay? So the first thing we can say that is similar to this in linear algebra. or if I put xi in there. This notation is similar to that notation in linear algebra, where you explicitly give the number of the component of the vector. This notation is more analogous to this notation in linear algebra. Okay. Where you don't show the explicit form of the component of the vector. Okay, that is what we mean. So think of the bra and cat notation as notation for abstract vectors like this in linear algebra. Okay? So how do we find the coefficient p sub n? We can use orthonormality property quite easily to find the p sub n. So 
is very much like what we often do in Fourier series expansion if you need to find the d sub n u in the product that with the bra vector, okay? You take the equation in the inner product with a bra vector, and then that equation will become something like this. Okay, just take this equation in the inner product with a bra vector. And this is, as has been defined uh, before, delta n n. So this will just become dm on the right hand side. So we init, immediately get the formula for dm. Or dm, which is like, like what you do as electrical engineering in Fourier series expansion. So this is the general case of a Fourier series expansion. Or we can call it generalized or general case. Okay. So then you can often write this G as in D N. You can write it in a very suggestive notation. You put the D N over here. Okay. And then I can write this as uh, psi n. dn can be replaced with psi n comma g. Okay. I just replace n with n and then just plug in this value of dn over here. I'll just plug in this value of dn over here. Put it on this side. It doesn't matter. This is just a scalar number. I can put it in front or behind. Okay. And then sum over n. Then if you look at this notation, it's reminiscent of something quite interesting. Because if you look at this piece over here, this piece over here is a outer product because this is a transpose, conjugate transpose of a vector. This is just a vector. Okay, so this is the vector. This is conjugate transpose. So if you have a vector multiplied by its conjugate transpose, what do you get in linear algebra? Say, if I have u dotting with u conjugate transpose, where u might be an n by one vector, its conjugate transpose will be one by n. If I multiply these two vectors together, what do I get? I get a matrix, right? I get a matrix on operator A, which is n by n. Okay? So you can think of this as forming a kind of an operator. Okay? And since this piece, when multiplied by g, always give back g, so we can think of this as an identity operator. And we know an identity operator in this manner. Okay? This piece becomes the identity <laughs> operator in the sense that when you multiply by g, you always get back g. Okay? So the outer product between two vectors sum over the complete set becomes an identity operator. And this often is used quite a bit in quantum mechanics, so it's something that you should no, and you should learn. Okay. So, but you have perhaps encountered this before in three vectors. Three vectors in three uh, D uh, vectors in three D space. And let's put some example of uh, say in a three D space we might have A1, A2, and A3 as our unit vectors in the three vectors. Okay, this might be x hat, y hat, z hat, pointing in this different direction. Then what it says is that if I use this rule, then I can make an identity operator. I just use the matrix notation here so as not to confuse things. Because hat here in many electrical engineering courses represent unit vectors. Okay, so this hat does not in, 
have the same meaning as this hat. This hat usually means uh, all greater and consummate pain. So think of this as three unit vectors, and if I form out of product between them, I get a sum and I get an identity of operator. And in many electrical engineering texts, okay, an outer product of three vectors, like uh, E and B, when it's written without a dot in between, this means an outer product. Okay? And in matrix notation, we should have said that if this is a three vector, this should be. In matrix, if this is linear algebra notation. And this is used a lot in physics and electrical engineering, especially electromagnetic. When you just put two vectors side by side, it means also product. Okay? So when you just put two vectors side by side in electrical engineering, in physics and in many electromagnetic notation, it just means the outer product between these two things. Okay. So I just use this notation to mean that this is used in linear algebra. This is an outer product. Because this is a three vector, three by one, this will be one by three. Okay. So this outer product gives you what is called a diode, which is three by three. Okay, this is what we call Diode. Putting two three vectors side by side with respect to each other, form a three by three matrix operator, which is called the diode in, in physics as well as in electromagnetics. So you can easily prove that this is a identity operator. Okay, this is an identity operator. For instance, I might form this with the um, Cartesian coordinate system. And if I multiply this with any vectors uh, E, which is any vectors expressed in terms of X, E, X, I'm using back electrical engineering computation where X hat, Y hat, Z hat means a unique vector. Okay, you can very clearly, when you plug this in, you get that X hat, E, X, plus Y hat, E, Y, plus have EZ. You can also concoct other kinds of identity operator in electrical engineering, like if you were to use theoretical coordinate system, you might have the three unit vectors to be R, theta, and C. Okay, you can easily show that this is also an identity operator when it operates on E that is expressed in a spherical coordinate. You have to express your E in terms of spherical coordinate system. Okay, again, you can show that you get back the vector itself. So this was just a kind of diversion. Okay. So in linear algebra, you can also get an identity operator if you had a set of unit or orthonormal vectors, these have to be orthonormal. Remember that we require this property in order to form the identity operator. If these are orthonormal, if you multiply them together and take outer product, this also forms an identity operator. You can convince yourself quite easily okay, that when this operates on any vector in the same space, you get back the vector itself. Okay, I don't think I've convinced uh, you of that. So are there, are there any questions so far regarding some of these vector properties that you sometimes see in linear algebra? So the twist here is actually this identity operator that is not often introduced in other electrical engineering courses. Okay. There are some other things that I'd like you to know about vectors, which is that the addition is associative, that means that it doesn't matter which vector you add first, okay? And the order of addition is not important, okay? It's commutative. It has a zero vector such that when you add zero to it, it becomes itself, and there's a negative vector so that when you add to it, it becomes zero, 
And then there should be a scale of number of that. <laughs> so it is distributed. You can multiply the addition out and form things like this. And then you will have things like this. That if you have two scalars added together, it's the same as a b plus b b. So it's distributed in the reverse sense. And then you have a b b is equal to a b c. Okay, you have identity number one that was multiplied by b gives you b back. Okay, a are scalar numbers. A, A is a scalar number, but A is also a field. In mathematics, we call a field. Okay, A can be belonging to the real number set, for instance. We will form a field. A field is a set of numbers that have the property that the additions and multiplications are close. Okay, if A is a real number, B is a real number, A, B is also a real number, a plus B is also a real number and so on. And it's quite obvious that A minus B would also be a real number. And then, um, and then the inverse is also a real number. Okay, the inverse is also a real number. The negative is also a real number. This is what the property of the field is. So real number is an example of a field. Okay, real number. Another set is rational numbers, complex numbers. Okay, complex numbers will have all these properties that I just mentioned. Rational numbers, if you add two rational numbers, they are rational numbers. If you multiply two rational numbers, they are rational numbers. If you inverse or negative them, okay, or negate them, they are still rational numbers. Complex numbers also have the same property. That if you multiply two complex numbers, add them, okay, reciprocate it, negate it, they are still complex numbers. Okay, these are called fields. And this A could be any of these fields, but usually we just use complex numbers in quantum mechanics. Okay, we use this as our thing. Okay, in quantum mechanics, So let's look at the concept of operators then. A differential operator is just something that we obtain by differentiating the function f of x, okay? This is called a differential operator. It can make gx look quite different from f of x. Okay. An integral operator is what we might have learned in Fourier transform that if you multiply this function f of x by e to the i k x and integrate, you get a new function. So this is a diff operator. This is a integral operator. A Fourier transform operator is an integral operator. It just makes a function look very different. So this is an analog of matrix operator in linear algebra. Like in linear algebra, we will have y is to the a dot x. And a is a matrix operator. And when you multiply x by a, you get a new vector y. And that vector y can look very different from the input vector x. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, we often denote a vector by the cat notation, an operator by a hat notation. So we say an operator a hat operator f gives you g. And it's very similar to this notation we have over here. And then it's quite clear that in matrix algebra, this is not true in general. So we cannot exchange the order 
of operators very easily. The order is very important. This means the order is important. Okay. So, so the next concept I'd like to introduce is a concept of a matrix representation of an operator. This is a very important concept in the modern day. Okay, what is the matrix representation of an operator? An operator can be an X abstract quantity like this, like a differential operator or an integral operator. They're very good to do mathematics with, but they are not easy to do computation with. We are modern digital computers. We can perform a matrix vector basis slide very easily on a computer. This is just a shorthand notation for E i j x j j equals 1 to n. This can be done with programming very easily. So a matrix times a vector can be done in a split of a second for many problems, but then this might not be easy to do. So oftentimes when we want to solve problems like this, we convert the operators into matrices in order to compute. So one way to convert operators into matrices is to use the concept of the matrix representation. What is the representation of this operator in certain subspaces that I have? Okay. So how do we find matrix representation in general? So let's go to some math. See, we have this operator equation, which in general cannot be programmed on a digital computer. We like to program this equation in a digital computer. The first thing we do then is to actually Use the concept of an identity operator. We just learned that if this is sum over a complete set, this is identity operator. And if this have the same space as this f and g, we can actually insert this in between and convert this equation. Okay, we can convert this equation into something that looks like this. I just insert this in between. Okay, let me do it in a, in a step like this. I can first write this equation as such. I can put an identity operator there without changing this equation because the definition of identity operator it does nothing to this app. So now I insert it inside. Okay. Let me just exchange the order of the summation a little bit. After I insert the identity operator, I just exchange the order. Since this thing is independent of n, I can take this summation outside, right? I just insert it and then take this summation outside. I get this equation. So this is almost a matrix equation now, but not quite. In order to convert this into a matrix equation, I multiply by size of m, the entire equation by size of m from both sides. And then with m ranging from 1 to infinity, I can do that. In other words, I project this equation into this vector. Okay, I project this equation into that vector. And if I do that, Then the equation I get is this one, size of m, g, n is to the 1 to infinity, size of m, a, f, size of n, size of n, f. Okay? So if I call this left hand side g, m, and if I call this a, m, n, and if I call it f of n, this is like a matrix equation now. A, 
n and f n, n is equal to 1 to infinity. So it almost looks like this kind of an equation that we have in linear algebra. Okay? So I can approximate this. In order to compute, I don't want to sum over infinity, I can approximate this. I can say, if I take n terms of a Fourier series, for instance, it's a good enough approximation. So I can translate my Fourier series at term n and use this approximation. Then, I do have a matrix equation that I can go to a digital computer and compute with. And there are many, many engineering computations that are done this way. Okay, that are done this way. And then your matrix equation can be written as G equal to matrix A times the vector F. This matrix A you call it the matrix representation of this operator A hat. Okay? And this vector F is the vector representation of this vector F. This vector G is the vector representation of the original function G. And we convert everything into the matrix notation that enables us to compute. This is a very important concept in the modern world. Okay, because we use digital computers so much. You have to be able to relate anything that you've done in abstract vector space to linear algebra. Okay, are there any questions with this concept? Okay, fair enough, it's a simple concept. So in general, it's very difficult to infer. This is an infinite dimensional matrix system. And in general, it's quite difficult to invert it. We try 